Hi, welcome to the QNX Virtual Campus Lecture Series. QNX has been used extensively in multimedia systems, and uh, we've recently decided to create our own multimedia solution. In today's video, Dan, the main architect from the Multimedia Project, is going to come to talk to you about some of its main components and how they work. Here's Dan. Hi, my name is Dan Cardmore, and I'm part of the QNX Multimedia Development Team. I'm here to talk to you today about the multimedia stack that is a middleware product designed to enable you to make really cool applications that do multimedia. As part of the QNX multimedia stack, we have four main components. We have IOFS, which is responsible for integrating external devices like iPods and iPhones and place for sure into the multimedia system. We have QDB, which is our relational database that does SQL, and it's designed to hold metadata and basically describe to an application designer everything that's in a multimedia system. We have the uh, IOMedia process, which is responsible for doing graphs, and these things carry the data of uh, decodes and encodes and parsers and all those things to do playback and ripping and copying. And then we have the multimedia engine, which is designed to orchestrate the whole system. It's the place where your application will talk to the multimedia stack and tell what tell what you want it to do. So taking a deeper look at each of the different components, uh, IOFS, again, I said, was the file system interface. You don't really usually want to just build a file system. You want to incorporate devices in your system. So uh, we've got this thing called MediaFast. It's pretty cool. You can basically uh, have, through one simple interface, talk to any kind of device. We've abstracted them all. We've got some good examples working. We've got Apple iPod, where you talk to it as an external device on through its uh, USB interface. We have uh, Microsoft Place for sure. We're doing MTP communication with it. Uh, Apple iPhone just ended up working because the Apple iPod protocol is the same. Uh, we've also got XM radio, DVD players, AM, FM radio, all sorts of other kind of cool external devices we've incorporated in the system very easily through this IOFS interface. So if you have your own devices or your own external things that you want to bring to an multimedia system, that is your interface to bring them in. KDB is a database that is based on SQL Lite. Because of this, we're SQL 92 compatible, we have transactions, it's asset compliant. Uh, has all those really neat features SQLite has. Also, because we're based on SQLite, you know that we have a reliable product. It's not going to give you corrupt databases all the time. It's very well tested and used in the, uh, in the industry. Um, we made some enhancements to it by wrapping with QDB. It's got a client server model now, so that lets you talk to it from any other node other than the one that you're actually running on. You don't have to be on the same and have access to those files. Um, in addition, uh, embedded systems don't always have hard drives, things that can write quickly, so we've added this backup or store functionality to QDB that lets you uh, checkpoint your data, essentially, that could be running in RAM, which is fast, and storing that into permanent store, like a NOR flash, which can sometimes be slow to write to, and you wouldn't want to run on that in a normal environment. Um, if you're looking for more information on it, you can check the Escalate website, but uh, we also have to provide the documentation with QDB. Um, in a multimedia system, what you're going to use QDB for is that's going to store all the metadata and all the information about what's happening in the multimedia system. For example, uh, the artist, the album, the genres of the art, of the music, uh, what devices are plugged into the system, what their names are, all that information you can get from QDB. And the MME will be updating that for you. You just have to read from it to figure out uh, what is of interest to you and how you want to interact with the system based on that content. Uh, IOMedia is our uh, graph management system. This takes care of the playing of content, the ripping of content, the copying of things from, let's say, USB stick to your hard drive, uh, delivering time notifications when you're playing, uh, pausing, uh, trick play if you want to go faster, uh, basically all those different things you would want to do. It actually sometimes also interacts directly with IOFS, sending commands to it to the external devices for you. Um, it's designed to have a nice encapsulation and, uh, and uh, abstraction from different hardware platforms. So that is the place where if you have a DSP to do all this work for you and offload all the work from the CPU to do the decodes or the encodes, you would do it within a graph inside IO Media. And all their applications, for example, MME or HMI, they wouldn't really necessarily need to know that they're on a different platform uh, that needs to offload the work onto the DSP. Uh, so this makes it very powerful for you to prototype your designs on, let's say, an x86 machine or something else that's fast and move them to a DSP. Or if you go through a cost reduction phase, it makes it easy at that point that you, you do the work and the, the optimization inside IO Media. but again, you've leveraged all your work and you get to keep all that intellectual property. You don't have to throw it away when you go from one platform to the next. 
The MME is the multimedia engine. This is the application that you'll communicate with directly from your HMI uh, that you'll tell it to do things like play or pause. And it's going to do the right things to orchestrate that through the system, whether doing a lookup for the file name from QDB to find out where it exists, or to talk to iMedia to tell it that it needs to play this and how it needs to play that content and where it's going to play that content. Uh, all the APIs are very easy to use, and because it's multimedia, people are used to things on their VCR or DVD where you can hit play and you understand what play does. So it's often a very simple API for people to pick up. Uh, it's responsible for a couple things in the system. Uh, it has a control context uh, interface that allows you to communicate to it, and that's the central place where things are going to get orchestrated from. But from there, there's uh, device detection and synchronization. So if you were to take an audio CD, for example, and put it to the system, we need to figure out that that is an audio CD and then figure out what kind of content is on it. So that will uh, do a bunch of enumeration, figure out that this isn't a DVD audio, it is in fact a CD audio disc, uh, that there are let's say 10 tracks on it and then it could do things like an AMG or FreeDB or Gracenet lookup or CD text and determine what the information is for all those tracks, the artist, the album, the genre, things like that. And it's going to go and populate all that information into QDB, which at the same time is visible by the HMI, so in real time you can see what's happening as things are synchronized. This is important too when you have a very large hard drive that can store hundreds of thousands of files. It can take time to synchronize that, but at the same time the people that are using your system want to be able to play something as soon as they insert it. So this is what is leveraged from that. In addition, there is the iMedia control as you can see there, and that's going to basically take control of talking to iMedia, make sure that it's copying and playing things as, as the HMI is instructed. And then on top of that, there's the track session management. When you play content, let's say an MP3 stick, uh, USB stick, you'll have hundreds of files and you want to play those in a particular order. The track session maintains that order, whether it's randomized or sequential, if it's got repeat settings, things like that. And it's going to enqueue those with iMedia as it's necessary. Uh, this is particularly useful as well for things like Gapless, where you need to be queuing up the next file to play before the first one finishes. All this is managed automatically by the MME and by iMedia. So one of the cool things about QNix is we have this technology called QNet. It allows you to basically take one process from one machine and have it talk to a different process from another machine without really needing to do any kind of network programming. It took us very little time to actually leverage all this really cool technology into the multimedia stack. And so we think because of this technology that you can make really cool products on your own. Uh, the whole world is going towards the client server and really cool device. People have phones that they want to control their houses with or you want to be able to have your car talk to your house to get your music. There's lots of possibilities and we think Kinex has a great position on this. And because of our position and being middleware, you can leverage all that work too. So here I want to just talk through a couple examples of how you can have an architecture that without little work can become something fairly powerful. So in this image here you can see that we have just a simple machine. You got one node, it talks to a set of speakers, and it's got the core components of the multimedia frameworks. You've got the MME, you've got QDB, you've got iMedia, and then your HMI is running the same machine talking to it through all the simple uh, interfaces we provided. Now, in this next picture, you can see that we've broken up the HMI from the rest of the system. It's on its own node. It hasn't made a single code change. It's now talking to a totally different uh, system. That's kind of cool. You could have, a, for example, uh, a phone that's got just the HMI, doesn't have any other software running, and then you've got an embedded box, let's say connected to your television, that looks like a DVD player that's running QNX and it's being controlled by the phone and now playing things on the screen. Right? Now this next example here shows you even further how you can extend the system. The ME was designed not to be able to play out of one thing, but it can actually play to multiple places at the same time. You can even have these synchronized if you want to. So in this example, we're showing how we have a second node running at another IO media, which could, let's say, be in the living room, but the first node is in the family room. So they're completely different places, and they're connected through some kind of networking, uh, which is abstracted by the whole system. And the really neat thing is that that one HMI can instruct each one to be playing different things, and they all have their own order, their own track sessions, their own output devices. If they want, they can reach other output devices. And, in fact, if we had IFS on both nodes, they can both see each other's file systems and devices, so a DVD in the family room can be played from the living room if you wanted. And then, a last 
change in architecture here, we're showing how you can have a second HMI on another completely different node, which can let you control the whole system. So let's say, for example, you've got, uh, you have a cell phone and someone else has a, just an ordinary punching remote control that can also control this whole system. The possibilities are endless. And uh, we think that it's very scalable, as you can see by our picture here. So in closing, I hope you enjoyed this presentation about the Kinex Multimedia Stack. Again, it's middleware that's supposed to make it easy for you to make really cool applications. Thanks for watching this presentation.